helps organizations see how they can achieve more responsible AI by improving machine learning explainability inaccuracy bias detection all that you need as the AI evangelist for Fiddler Labs. She educates data scientists on the use of continuous monitoring for modern ML ops. Modern ML ops, that's what we're talking about today. Mm, Amy is the co-author of O'Reilly books on graph algorithms and knowledge graphs, as well as a contributor to the upcoming book on AI and trial. Amy has consistently helped teams apply novel approaches to generate new opportunities. Working at companies such as Microsoft, Hewlett Packard, Neo4j, and Cray. Amy has a love for science and a fascination for complexity. Studies, Amy, we're so thankful for you to be here today with us. We're gonna talk a little bit about drift and the four kinds that we can encounter. That's your intro, Amy. Welcome to the MLOps Community Podcast wow. and Meetup, I should say, not podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, wow, Demetrios, I've never been sung an intro, so <laughs> lifetime first, I can check off my list. There you go. Congratulations. Also, you. Yeah, I think that's amazing. <laughs> one one last thing for the bucket list. There it yeah. is. Well, so. we're excited to have you here. I think we have a quorum. We can go ahead and get started. I'm really excited to talk about Drift with you today. And before we start, I will mention that, uh, and I also want to thank the whole Fiddler squad because you all were one of the first sponsors of the MLOps community, which is, it means so much to me to have you being a sponsor and being part of the community, throwing your weight behind the community and saying, yes, we like what you're doing. And so, yeah, if anybody wants to check out Fiddler, we'll leave some links in the chat. We'll also leave it in the description if you are listening in the future. And I'm going to hand it off to you, Amy. Thanks again for being here and talking to us today. Thank you. Um, and uh, thank you, actually, for being such a great uh, lead for the community. I think, you know, bringing people together for, for me is really important to learn from each other because this space is... Um, no matter how long you've been in it, it just keeps moving and evolving and emerging. And, mm. uh, you know, I'm, I feel like I'm learning all the time. So, um, so I really appreciate your efforts. Uh, yeah. The whole team does. Uh, and we will have towards the end, a special guest, um, that should be jumping into the room as well. So I'll leave it at that and nice. uh, we can kind of wait in anticipation for, uh, for that extra person. Um, but I did, I guess I do want to say that I'm also learning, uh, you know, about drift myself. So I feel like we're kind of going through this journey, you know, together. So if you, if you have questions that I can answer, like really excited to do that, I may not know all the answers. And if I do, if I say something that, um, that you guys, uh, you know, feel like we need to clarify or, you know, look, let me know, because I want to improve what we're doing and we can kind of learn from each other. Um, so I'm going to take you a little bit on my journey of learning with uh, ML Drift, and I'll just say, you know, to begin with, you know, the whole, the whole thing, the whole reason why we're uh, most of us are are into or uh, looking at machine learning is that we're we're trying to make predictions and model um, how the world works so that we can then make you know better predictions and decisions. Um, but the interesting thing about that is, uh, you know, it's only as good as 
uh, you know, as we can align to what the real world looks. So I love this Calvin and Hobbes uh, cartoon because, you know, in the real world, nothing ever seems to be the same twice so that we're always chasing uh, our models and, and chasing the real world and, and how we can um, align to that. And that uh, just for me one is thing, really- Amy, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. I think the aspect ratio on the screen that you have is a little bit wide. So we're getting the bottom part cut off and then the top part is just like black. Is there any way oh, for you to compress it more? There we go. Now we see better? everything. Yes, that's awesome. Ah, sorry about that. Okay. That's well, all right. it was just a Calvin and Hobbes. So <laughs> you didn't you didn't miss too much, although there's nothing like good Calvin and Hobbes. Yeah. Um, but good, so you can see everything. Awesome. Uh, so really, when you're talking about machine learning uh, drift or model drift, all it really means is that we're just, you know, the, the predictions are getting worse over time. Uh, and some people call that decay or, or um, you know, prediction drift, uh, but it just means predictions are getting worse over time. Um, Demetrius already did a wonderful introduction, so I don't need to do that, <laughs> that. Um, but I am the responsible AI uh, evangelist for Fiddler. If you're not familiar with Fiddler, uh, one of the things that I think the team is very passionate about is building trust into AI. And so we've been recognized for, you know, expertise in modeling and explainability, but the team is very passionate about like, how do I trust what I'm doing? And so drift is obviously a big topic for us because if you can't trust your predictions and how they're performing, then you can't obviously trust your, your AI overall. Uh, and it actually does have some big impact. So this is just two quotes for, for uh, from some customers that uh, I can't, can't tell you the names, but you can see that model drift can actually have some pretty big impact. You know, there's financial impact, um, you know, $500,000 in a weekend is, is a huge financial uh, impact for a business. Uh, or if you're a team and you're taking, you know, weeks to troubleshoot a problem because you can't pinpoint like why are the, you know, performance metrics going down. That's just a lot of your time as well. And I'm sure there are other things that most of you would rather be doing than troubleshooting um, the uh, a problem. So th that's just kind of to show the, the real world impact and, and why model drift is important. Um, I will say this is something that it took me, I think it was like several weeks of reading papers and just getting caught up in terminology and driving my team crazy in terminology that I would say, don't, don't get too caught up in terms because there's not a ton of agreement. Um, model drift, model decay, prediction drift just means your predictions are getting worse. Um, the different people tend to describe drift many different ways. Sometimes they talk about their experience of drift and use that as a type of drift. They talk about the causes, they talk about how they measure it. And I think of these as all descriptors of predictions getting worse and they use them in overlapping ways. Uh, a lot of times different types of drifts can happen at the same time, uh, and you can get uh, drift that um, that happens um, kind of in a layered way, and one can cause the other. So terminology, there's a lot of terminology up there, and if you're looking through it and you're like, I'm having trouble disaggregating it, I've got a couple tips on that. But I would say just don't get too caught up in it. It's really about like what you need to do, you know, practically. Um, so, so first kind of how you experience drift. So this is one of the first ways that you may, you may hear people talk about it. They'll talk about abrupt drift and, and that's just an abrupt change. Um, they may talk about gradual drift where things are kind of slowly, um, getting worse, uh, or I guess just changing or incremental drift, seeing different, um, labels coming in and watching that slowly change as well. Something that's periodic. So we do get a lot of questions about, um, frequency and, uh, periodic drift. Uh, so that's something that's kind of reoccurring. And then there's blips as well, which I think of more as outliers, uh, and it's not really drift, but it's often confused with drift and you can use some of the same methods to, to take a look at it. So these are kind of what I would call, call descriptors of how we experience drift. Um, so you may see these terms as well. Uh, and there's a really great um, uh, blog post where I stole this image from, uh, the ravages of concept drift, uh, that is uh, kind of a nice visual reference. Um, but if we think about the key types of drifts, drift, where, where it's not just the uh, how we're experiencing it, this is where you know, things start to uh, make sense for me or where you know, things start to come together. 
Uh, on the left, you can see, you know, the training data uh, with a decision boundary in there. You know, is this dot yellow or is it blue? That's my decision and I've got my decision boundary. Um, what's the probability of uh, Y given X? So color given some factors. Concept drift is probably the, I would say the easiest to think about maybe. Um, and that's where the relationship actually changes. So you can see that decision boundary there. The, um, the dots haven't changed position. They haven't changed color. Uh, the data is the same, but the re reality has changed. The uh, behavior has changed. Uh, this is the classic um, you know, example that people are using now of, of you know, buying behavior and, and um, toilet paper is, you know, or yoga pants, you know, that during the pandemic, the behavior and the, the buying decision of what kind of pants um, or what to get at the grocery store changed. And so it's an actual change of behavior. That's the, can be the hardest type of drift to actually catch and prove, uh, especially, uh, and, you know, if you're receiving uh, ground truth labels uh, for production events, and, uh, and those are kind of lagging. Uh, so that can be hard to catch, but that's kind of the, for me, one of the easiest to think about. Uh, and then you have data drift. And I have a little asterisk here because speaking of terminology, some people consider concept drift a type of data drift uh, because the data will change with concept. Uh, but usually when people are talking about data drift, they're talking about um, changes to either the input or the output data itself. So you have data changes, but the fundamental decision criteria, so that boundary there, if you look at that from the, the first far left to, um, to the far right here, is that the boundary, um, the decision criteria is the same. So people are, are using the same heuristics to make their decisions or the behaviors or the change are, are the same, but the data itself has shifted. So you can kind of see the little yellow dots uh, have shifted there. So in data drift, what people often talk about and what I kind of prefer talking about is label drift and feature drift because it's more precise and it clearly differentiates it from concept drift. And so label drift, and, and label drift um, the probability of Y changes. And that doesn't necessarily affect accuracy, although it can. Um, but if let's say you have something where um, in loan application, the ratio of people eligible for loans suddenly increases. Uh, and this may lead to like, uh, you know, a loss of opportunity if the business, business um, isn't kind of ready uh, to meet that change. Um, feature drift, again, this is where X changes, the input actually changes, your something about the feature changes. Uh, and this may or may not affect accuracy. Um, and some drift uh, in data is to be expected in general. Um, but just like label drift, it could lead to issues elsewhere in the business. If the model starts seeing data that it's not seeing during trade it, uh, training, there may be surprises, or it can actually cause uh, accuracy changes. So uh, one, of the, one of the things that people do talk about a little bit when they're talking about um, these kind of drifts is this virtual drift. And this is where the data changes, but the boundary itself still works. So you can see in this uh, lower right visual, the decision uh, boundary is the same, um, but the data has actually shifted. At least the little yellow dots have shifted considerably, but your decision criteria still works. But in the one in the uh, on the top of data drift, the decision boundary is the same, but the yellow dots or the little orange dots have gone to farther to the top. And so in that case, uh, it is actually affecting your accuracy. Uh, so it's it's important to look for those different types of drift, uh, but not getting too caught up into um, you know whether they impact uh, yet or not, but just kind of know what's going on. So a couple examples of um, drift examples, I guess, in loan applications, just to give you kind of it always helps for me to think about um, uh, examples is you might have some macroeconomic factors, something that's changed in the economy that makes lending riskier in general. And so um, there might be a higher standard to be eligible for a loan. So that means that people that had been eligible, let's say last year or two years ago, uh, because of the pandemic or some other uh, factor, that same bar has changed. So the bar for credit worthiness is, is no longer um, a steady state. So the relationship has actually changed. So in label drift, kind of an example of what we were talking about, maybe a larger portion of credit worthy applicants are now showing up. So maybe you launched a product 
you had launched it in one area and now you've gone to a more affluent area where you're now offering loans. And so your model um, in this case would still be accurate, but you might want to know that that's going on because maybe you only have so much credit to offer. So, so kind of understanding that the, the output labels are changing. And so credit worthy, not credit worthy. And now all of a sudden you have like four times as many credit worthy applicants, but maybe you don't have four times as much cash to, to lend out. Um, so it's important to, to know um, how your ground truth is actually changing as well. Uh, and then feature drift, uh, again, thinking about the, um, the uh, incoming, maybe incomes of your applicants have changed in general in an area, like maybe um, because of inflation, you know, people's wages are going up. Uh, so that you may you may need to know that. Or suddenly, let's say you get more applicants from one region. So maybe uh, applicants in California look different than applicants in uh, Minnesota. And all of a sudden, you're getting a lot from Minnesota where credit worthiness is less based on income itself or a score, but maybe it's more uh, appropriate to be looking at income to debt ratio in that region for you know whatever uh, whatever reason. So understanding that feature drift, it can also of course impact your your accuracy. Yes. So Kessie is asking, and I'm not a I'm sometimes a terrible multitasker, so I'll try to answer questions as they come in. But um, so Kessie is asking if label and feature drift here are part of draft, data drift. Yes, that's how I like to think of them, um, and they are part of data drift. I Think of concept drift as uh, a little different, even though it has data implication, but because the fundamentals are about relationships and concepts, for me, it's easier to think about that separately. But yes, label drift and feature drift, definitely um, part of data drift. And Amy, just so yeah. you can focus on this, I'll flag when awesome. a question pops up and Thank I'll you. jump back on camera and, and ask you the question so you can awesome. Thank uh, you. not have to multitask. Awesome. Great. Um, all righty. And so um, triggers of model drift. And these are harken back to what we were just talking about. Um, but the triggers are, you know, real change of data. So the labels, um, maybe people in the positive class, credit worthy, um, distribution can change. Uh, maybe people are coming in with higher incomes. Uh, or both. So, you know, the, the people in the positive class, the label or higher incomes might be coming in. And this can happen, like, let's say we we launch the new pro the product in a new market. Uh, the concept may change or it may not. Um, if it does not, it may not be an actionable issue. So it can change even if it doesn't actually require you to take action on it. And then, of course, concept can change. We talked about that. So that could be... Um, you know, not just people uh, changing what they apply for, but maybe you have a competitor offering better contracts. Uh, and so you're likely, so what triggers your customers to actually even apply for the loan has changed. Uh, and so this would require, um, you know, you to actually look at, you know, a new model or, or retraining your model. Um, the other thing we haven't talked about yet is data integrity issues. And this is, um, you might see this as, experience this as the blip. So as the outlier or some kind of a sudden um, change, or you might, or it might feel like an actual, um, uh, you know, sudden change where it's actually, you know, kind of, it feels like it's, it's changed in a larger way. Um, and that can be, data integrity issues can come in a couple of different ways. Uh, it might be correct data is being entered on the front end, um, but you might have some data engineering that's not working well. Um, maybe somebody's act accidentally um, flipped uh, debt to income values and age values. Uh, or something I actually have seen in real life is where you have a, a data pipeline uh, in dollars and then you're always adding in more information. And so you're adding in new pipe, you know, new pipelines of data and actually seeing somebody accidentally add in a new, um, a new data input in cents, not dollars. And the model, because it's taking in you know, um, transaction values from all over the place, was still chugging along fairly okay. And then it was just gradually getting worse because the longer the, the, the cents, not dollars, information came in, the, um, the more it skewed it. So you, know, you can just have a data engineering or, or an ML pipeline issue. Uh, and then you can also see things like just incorrect data at the source. So you might have a front-end issue that allows people um, to leave a field bet blank. So you have a bunch of null values where you used to have uh, actual data coming in. And so that can skew things over time. Um, so 
here, I just like to pause and say, okay, but really what's important? Uh, it doesn't matter if it's the data change or the reality, the concept change, or you know what actually caused it. And I may offend some purists out there, but I'm not sure it really, really matters. Um, as long as you're tracking um, you know, where there are issues, you try, you're being able to analyze to root cause, and then of course you're taking care of it. So um, it's good to understand the concepts, uh, but again, I wouldn't get too worked up in uh, the actual terminology is when you start seeing drift, uh, if you're monitoring for drift, uh, you can act on it without having to um, be an expert in the difference between concept and feature drift and um, how one can cause the other, or you can have feature drift, but then not have a concept or it's okay. Um, we just need to track things and be able to get to root cause so we can do something about them. Uh, so the way, a couple different ways you can try to detect issues. If you have labels, yay. Um, ground truth is a wonderful, beautiful thing. Uh, you can do things like monitoring performance. Uh, you can do some supervised learning on it. If you don't have labels, uh, which especially in a real world um, streaming case, you're trying to predict fraud uh, on credit cards at scale, your labels are going to lag. And you might not, um, you, well, you might not trust your labels, uh, but you it can be expensive sometimes um, to you know, label data and uh, do the compute over it. Um, so if you don't have labels, uh, looking at things like data drift is really important because data drift can be a leading indicator of uh, eventual uh, label changes, uh, of concept changes. And so it can kind of be a leading indicator before something gets really bad. And you can also do some unsupervised learning on that as well. And then data integrity monitoring, because if, well, I would say one of the lowest hanging fruit is if you have an issue and you are monitoring for you know, outliers or something, um, missing values and things like that, sometimes that you'll know right away that that's an issue. It's kind of a low hanging fruit you can kind of eliminate if you're troubleshooting really quickly. Uh, so, perf let's, so if we think about each one of those, um, performance monitoring and supervised learning, again, ground truth labels, if you got them, use them, that's fantastic. Um, you can do basically monitoring of performance metrics. So your statistical measures of, um, you know, AUC, um, false positive rates, negative rates, accuracy, you know, precision recall, all of those metrics. You should be monitoring those because the, if you see a, a big drop, you know something's wrong. That's like the big red flag. Uh, I've got a screenshot in here of it's maybe a little hard to see, but anyhow, uh, the Fiddler screen uh, looking at uh, those performance metrics. Uh, so if you if you have them using a tool that can just kind of do that quick statistical analysis in a nice real-time way to say, you know, is there any big red flags that are going on? Uh, you can also- Quick uh, question look coming at, through in the, oh, in okay. the chat. Yeah, what's going on? Uh, so for data distribution shift, do we rely on something like KL divergence? What is recommended in practice? All right. That's actually, that is my next slide. So I'm going to answer oh. that in just a second. Uh, and then it looks like someone's asking about thresholds to um, predict drift. It really depends on your use case. And so I would say there's, there's two papers that I really uh, have enjoyed recently. The first one is actually here, a survey of concept drift adaptation. Um, they don't talk as much about thresholds because it is dependent upon your use case and how much, um, how much you can tolerate things like false positives. Uh, but they do go through uh, several different supervised learning methods that you can do on your own. Um, you know, if you have a team and you're, you, you know, you're calculating that and you're comfortable with it, they look at things like sequential analysis. Uh, and that's like the, you probably, the cumulative sum analysis, um, pH, you've probably seen those. I like those two are kind of nice because you can tune alarms and tune for false positives. They're fairly popular, um, but you can also do statistical process controls. Um, the interesting thing about those, um, those algorithms for learning is you can actually look at the rate of change. So not just, you know, is the distribution changing or is the um, concept changing, but uh, what is the rate of change, which I find fascinating because that may be something you can tolerate or, or something you have to get involved in fairly quick. Um, and then there's the uh, modeling um, two distributions at once as well. 
more precise in general, and the paper goes through why they're more precise, um, but there's a lot more overhead in, as well, so the compute and the time to do it. So those are kind of the, if you have ground truth. And then to get to, I think some of the questions, the last two questions we're, we're um, referring to is, okay, Amy, you've convinced me, we've got to monitor data for data drift, how the heck do I do that? Um, statistical distribution metrics, easiest way um, to do that. And there's four here uh, that are probably maybe the most popular, uh, and there's many others, uh, but the first one is like the, the PSI or the Population Stability Index. Uh, you're just looking at the a current scoring variable um, to predicted probability distribution uh, in your training data. That is fairly popular in financial services. Um, the next one is the KL, uh, KL divergence, uh, and that measures the difference of one probability distribution um, to another, probably your reference, your, your training set. Um, and that's fairly uh, well known and popular. So thank you. I think that was Amir for bringing that up. Um, there's also the Jensen Shannon divergence, and that is actually based on the KL divergence. Um, that's the one that uh, that we as uh, Fiddler have chosen to use, and um, that's because it's uh, symmetric and it has uh, it requires a finite. It always has a finite value, which is very nice to not go badly wrong in your your measures or not allow that. Uh, so uh, we use the JS uh, div, uh, divergence, but uh, there's also the KS test and Kolmogorov Smirnov test. I hope I said that not too terribly. Um, that is interesting because it, it again is looking at divergence, um, but it's uh, it doesn't require a, a normal distribution. So if you have a seriously skewed distribution in your data, uh, that may be something you want to look at as well. And so monitoring for that. Um, you can run these yourself, of course, uh, but there are tools out there like Fiddler that actually come um, with some of these measures out of the box. So uh, that can be, you know, something that uh, just makes your life a little bit easier. And then I think to um, Kessie's uh, question, uh, you, you know, threshold really depends on your use case. But if you are using a tool or some of these measures, you can play around with your thresholds to tune for false positive, false um, negatives. Uh, different um, different thresholds that your team can tolerate and that also you find are um, significant enough drift because uh, uh, some drift is to be expected and you wouldn't want to react to each and every um, moment of drift. Um, the other way to look at drift is to um, roll your own. So you can use unsupervised, and I should say it's really unsupervised and semi-supervised methods. Um, the paper here, I really like, uh, you can just Google or afterwards we can send you links, uh, overview of unsupervised uh, drift detection me methods. This is a really, um, the, yes, Amir, track, track them per feature. <laughs> so you wanna definitely um, uh, track your uh, distribution um, per, uh, per, fe per feature. Um, but one of the things that you can do if you're doing it on your own, like I said, this paper is a really great paper. I just did a, a little screenshot of all the different methods that they uh, that they kind of give you a little more information on. Each one of these have, um, they detect different types of uh, drift or some of them are application specific. Uh, some of them have different qualities. The first half in this list are batch and the second half are online. Uh, one of the things that you may notice by using machine learning to, um, to look for drift is it can actually be more accurate, uh, but it can also be a little more timely. So the online methods tend to have higher accuracy. They look at each and every instance, and you can imagine, and they use kind of a sliding window to do that. Uh, the batch methods are much more efficient, so there's a lot of overhead and looking at each instance and trying to, to measure how, the, how it compares to your um, training. Um, you'll notice in this list, a lot of the most um, unsupervised learning for drift detection are globally oriented, um, which means that they may miss regional um, shifts and more gradual drift. Um, they also sometimes have sensitivity issues. So again, thinking about that false positive, um, false negatives, is they can be very sensitive to changes and they're looking at the, the global. Um, you may not, and you, as I said, you may miss regional shifts, like maybe, maybe Hawaii, um, start shifting uh, differently than the rest of your than the rest of the country and in, in loan applications and approvals, and you may miss out if you're looking at global. Uh, and then I'd also say one of the biggest issues is that 
uh, if you're doing unsupervised, uh, you know, learning to try to, to track drift, it can be really hard to explain what's going on and to kind of get to root cause if, uh, you know, if you've not just tracked that there's drift, but you're not now trying to figure out like, why the heck is this going on and what can I do about it? Um, so I hope I, I hope everybody's doing this uh, already. Is the uh, so the other way to detect drift, or in this case, it's not really drift; it's integrity and outlier. Is to of course be monitoring it. Um, data errors can come in slowly, as I mentioned. Even if you're going to something like from dollars to cents, uh, if it's a small little bit of your um, of your incoming data. They creep in over time, missing values, um, schema mismatches, maybe your data engineer split out your transaction types from two types to four types. Um, those things can um, degrade uh, and cause uh, real drift or look like real drift and cause you know, real issues as well. Uh, it could be anything from like new products that are rolling out to, like I said, data um, pipeline issues as well. So just my plug for, I really hope everybody's doing this, low hanging fruit, easy to watch for issues, you know, and you can get alerts on it. So getting to root cause, you at this point, hopefully believe in um, drift detection, uh, have a couple methods that you can use and apply, um, playing around with tuning um, different parameters. Um, so if you believe in monitoring for it at this point, of course, you want to identify drift as quickly as possible. So monitoring it continuously is, uh, is really important. I threw in a Fiddler screenshot, not sure how easy it is uh, to see some of this stuff, but at the top, we're kind of looking for, you know, real-time drift compared to this baseline set. And you know, we hit some kind of threshold that we have decided is appropriate. Uh, and in this case, as I said, we're using the, um, the uh, JS divergence. But from there, you'd want to drill down into the features. So somebody had asked about features. So maybe you're seeing this real-time drift, and then you'll want to drill down and say and to look at well, which features are one important for my prediction? That has to do with explainability. Um, this is not an explainability talk, uh, but Fiddler does do that. Other you know tools do that as well, where you actually are looking at the importance of different features. But if you look at hey, this feature is really important in my data. I'm seeing, I've hit a threshold in my distribution. Uh, now I go down and look at the feature and notice not only is certain features more important, but maybe they're drifting uh, more as well. So you're looking at your feature drift as well as your overall prediction drift. And looking at those two things together can help you pinpoint because you might have a feature that's drifting considerably. So the distribution in that uh, feature, so an example would be the number of products somebody bought or services they bought from your financial institution, you may see that all of a sudden um, people are starting to buy more and more products. But is that impacting your overall accuracy? Maybe, maybe not. It kind of depends on the importance of that particular feature. So you put those two things together and you analyze the feature importance and then look at the traffic as well. Is the traffic coming in dependent on that feature? And so those three things together are really important. And I've always felt like um, you know, monitoring and explainability go together. Like to, to understand an issue is going on is great. Uh, to understand there's a drift or prediction accuracy, you know, is going down, great. But if you can't explain why, if you can't kind of drill down, um, that doesn't kind of get you to the next step. Uh, there's so another question the, that just came through oh, yeah. uh, along these lines, and it's how does Fiddler do the feature importance neural network based models? So um, uh, Fiddler does not, it, you can do feature, um, and I'll go back here. You can do um, feature explainability, or at least Fiddler can, uh, even for um, kind of deep learning and uh, black box models. Um, so we use uh, Shopley values uh, or SHAP, depending on where you're from, uh, and looking at how the, the features uh, impact the, the model and as well as uh, variance on that as well. So we also use integrated um, uh, gradients to, to look at that. So, you know, even if you don't have a, um, uh, sorry, I'm distracted a little bit. So even if you don't have an interpretable model, um, Fiddler will use uh, either SHAP or integrated values, or you can use actually, if you have your own explainability, um, we can also incorporate that as, as well. So the next step would of course be, you know, fixing um, the issues that, uh, that may come in. 
Uh, and that's easily said, and this is not a fix it webinar and it's not my area of expertise. And I hope all of you are, are um, you know, experts in the area of, of taking care of your models once you've figured out there's a problem and you've understood that um, perhaps that has to do with um, number of products that are changing or income level. Uh, but there are basically three ways to, to fix your models or three approaches is, is one, you retrain it. And that can be in, you know, that can be it's perfectly valid and often is. Uh, especially if you have concept drift and the, the relationship is actually changing to how people make decisions or um, how a manufacturer, let's say another concept drift would be a, a manufacturing element or component that was wearing. And so the, the actual function of the component is changing. So, um, you know, retraining with new data uh, or relabeling old data, as painful as that can be, is sometimes uh, necessary. Uh, or adding in, um, and the, this kind of actually gets into the adapt and augment. So uh, you might have, you might want to change your model behavior or weight things differently uh, or change business logic as well. So for an example, if you are um, doing credit card fraud and you find on the weekends, all of a sudden spring of this year, um, Friday to Saturday night, you get a ton of false positives. So all of a sudden you're denying credit. Um, to people that are trying to go out and have have a good time and hopefully get back to um, you know normal um, trips to the pub and and what have you, uh, you're losing out on money immediately and you're upsetting your customers. So bad things. And you might decide that hey, my model in general still works, um, but I am going to augment my model and amplify weekend based information in the spring. Uh, and maybe that has different um, frequencies that I need to do that. And in that example, maybe the appropriate thing is to collect different information or weight information for the weekends more heavily, but maybe it's also to um, have a second model and to schedule the models for different times. So you might, in model management, you might archive some models and bring them out in certain schedules, uh, or you might change uh, an ensemble uh, method and balance uh, models differently. So just some tips, not my area of expertise, uh, but ways that we've seen, you know, people out there, practitioners uh, trying to, to deal with uh, the drift and kind of uh, get their models back to performing. Um, so with that, I think we're ready for Q&A if we've got some questions. All right. Do most machine learning engineers deal with how to fix it? Is that something that should go in the machine learning engineer uh, job description? Yeah, um, that's a great question. So I actually think um, we, you probably see more of your data engineers and your, excuse me, your data scientists um, dealing with um, the fix it, but it really depends on what the problem is. So um, that's why I feel like explainability is a big part of the solution is that if you find that uh, that the problem is really a data integrity issue, obviously that would be like your data engineer um, that, that might assist with it. Uh, so, But if you find that it is really a concept change and there's a behavioral change after looking at features uh, that are in, incoming that have drifted and you're thinking about the logic of how your model's working, that may be data scientists. And so the one thing that I think is kind of nice to see um, that uh, actually it looks like Josh is coming in, come into room. There we go. Josh is the um, special that, guest. Uh, that is kind of nice to see with a tool that can span different groups. Um, Fiddler has this, I'm sure there are other tools out there as well, but to have kind of a unified dashboard so that you as a team can notice when something comes up and communicate that um, to other team members. So maybe your uh, ML engineer has noticed there's an issue, uh, but then you can uh, you can shoot it over to your data scientists, have them take a look at the exact same data. Uh, so you're talking about the same issue. So uh, I'm a big proponent of you know anything to help with the communications between the different teams. And it just kind of depends on where the um, where the issue comes in. Does Fiddler? Oh, and we got Josh here. This was oh, the hey, special Josh. guest that yeah. we were hiding, I guess. Uh, Josh, hey, hey, everybody here. So I am um, going to ask the question from the crowd. This is: Does Fiddler integrate with MLflow and other MLOps tools? 
So, so the answer is, the simple answer is yes, and I'll let Josh add more uh, detail, but we can basically um, ingest like, you know, from any data source and, you know, any, any um, model type. So whether using um, uh, SageMaker, MLflow, TensorFlow, uh, Scikit-Learn, you know, whatever that, that may look like. Yeah, maybe I'll just I'll just add uh, a thing here. Um, so, you know, there's different flavors of what MLflow provides, um, and then from the Fiddler perspective, there's different kind of tiers of of what what we provide. So there's monitoring that's a sort of um, mostly data flow only, but then there's also model ingestion, and that gets you sort of high fidelity explainability and stuff like that. And so for cases where uh, our customers have are already in the MLflow ecosystem and have models that are sort of you know, wrapped in MLflow, there is a sort of optimized uh, model ingestion path where you can take advantage of the, the MLflow, you know, all the nice functionality that's been built around that to, you know, for example, expose your model, predict. Um, so it's a, it's a sort of a, a simplified streamlined model ingestion. Um, but, you know, the, so, so in some areas it works really well, um, but there are sort of different flavors of, you know, what MLflow means to your org and, uh, you know, as I said, uh, Fiddler provides some different capabilities also. So hmm. in some places, they, they, they definitely, uh, it's supported and they, they interact well. So the caveat there is, what are you using it for? And which tool are you talking about? And what are you using Fiddler for? That is probably one of the most difficult things, I think, with the tooling ecosystem right now and just machine learning in general is how many use cases and how things don't necessarily fit like Lego blocks yet. Uh, so hopefully we see that over the next coming years. There's another question coming through. Do you, Amy or Josh, have any recommendations on resources to learn more about how to fix it? And it, I'm assuming, is something that we talked about before uh, that is probably something that has to do with drift, I would say, but uh, Kessie, if you want to throw model drift. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So I, I just put up a slide with a few resources, um, more in kind of, uh, map, uh, I was thinking more of the, the monitoring and uh, explainability. Um, so the first two, you know, if you just want to learn more about model performance management, it, you know, Fiddler has a lot of resources there. Um, just kind of FYI or a plug um, for the for our team that just uh, put out a free O'Reilly book on model performance management that has uh, some more detail on monitoring and drift, and just kind of goes into um, detail on on the, all the different concepts. Um, that should be up on our website by early next week. And if you guys are looking for it and haven't seen it, ping me. We'll make sure to get you a copy. Um, there's also, if you're interested in explainability, we had an explainability summit uh, a couple of weeks ago that was was pretty interesting, had um, a fantastic uh, keynote on explainability and actually had a lot of ML ops into it. Um, if you're looking for infrastructure, uh, so again, this is not fix it yet, but if you're looking at infrastructure um, uh, kind of suggestions, there's a nonprofit there that uh, has some nice independent information. Um, the last two are going to be closer to, I think, what the what Kessie was looking for, and those were the papers that I mentioned earlier in the section um, on model drift. The first one on unsupervised, and I think they, I think that one um, talks more about the drift and the detection. The second one on the survey of concept drift adaptation uh, is looking more at supervised, but they go into more detail on um, how to deal. Um, with model drift uh, after you've detected it. So that one may be a good resource as well. Um, Josh, do you have other resources that uh, that you like? I think that's actually a really good list. Um, so I, I, I don't, nothing else comes to mind that I would add here. Hmm. Okay. Excellent. And so there is someone in the crowd that has their hand up. I'm not sure if you want me to unmute you. Uh, Murtasa, hopefully I got that correct. Or if, oh, nope, put the hand down. <laughs> so maybe they were like, oh. no, no, nope, <laughs> now I don't want to go. Uh, and I, I guess while we're waiting, <laughs> rogue hand, <laughs> nice. While we're waiting for someone else to formulate another question, 
Um, well, Josh, maybe we should introduce you and can you tell us who you are and what you do? Yeah, so I run the, the data science team at Fiddler. Um, so all okay. of these issues around feature drift and uh, you know concept drift and thinking about um, feature impact and explainability. I did a lot of work last year in particular on explainability um, and some of our like um, explainability for complex multimodal models. We can do some really neat stuff if you have, you know, combinations of sequential data and uh, uh, dense vectors and things like that. Um, hmm. Particularly like in the deep learning context, you know, uh, text plus tabular. Um, there's some really neat explainability use cases there. Um, in a former life, I was a physicist, um, but I've been with Fiddler for a couple of years now. Um, and uh, geez. Maybe just to follow up, uh, so, so one thing that's been really lately interesting for us, and I don't know that I would advertise this kind of feature-wise, but one thing we've been thinking about a lot is, um, you know, are there times when you want to monitor drift in features that aren't single features? And so there's a use case that we see sometimes is there'll be like a, a customer who has like an XGBoost classifier, um, but they'll do something like feed a uh, natural language through a BERT model beforehand as a pre-processing step. So then, you know, what they've got is a bunch of like semantically meaningful features that they're trying to watch drift in. And then all of a sudden you'll get, you know, um, 128 uh, embedding components that are also being fed into the same thing. And um, it turns out it's a really interesting case because those components don't tend to have a lot of human semantic meaning. But if you can monitor those, those vectors as a whole, you can you can map it back to your you know whatever the source was even though it's you know some internal representation from a um, some upstream model. Um, so the, 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 there was an earlier question that was about you know whether you monitor drift in features one at a time or as groups. And I think increasingly we're seeing scenarios where there may be some subset of features that you want to monitor as a block because as a block they carry some you know, human level semantic information that's useful, you know, both in understanding what's happening to your data, but also may carry significance for like the business use case that your model's for, something you might want to surface to, you know, business teams at your org. So that's really, really interesting. Um, anyway, that's that's been on my mind a lot lately. Uh, Super cool. Thank you for sharing that. I have a question here and while we're letting others formulate questions uh, about that. And I know that, uh, I think it was probably like four or five months ago now, Fiddler put out an, a blog post that was talking about how to monitor different stages of your machine learning life cycle. And it wasn't just monitoring things once they were out in the wild. And it reminded me a lot of, and I think I even mentioned this to Krishna, the CEO of Fiddler, for those who are listening, about how it reminded me a lot of another concept I've heard called like an evaluation store and how you're evaluating things or you're monitoring things as they go through and live through the life cycle. And so I'm wondering how you all feel about this. Like, is there is there enough to be like enough problems that you're working on when it comes to just monitoring after you push something to production that you're like, hey, I'm going to try and really crack that nut? Or do you see most monitoring companies going to this like more spread out and really trying to monitor each piece of the puzzle and the data quality, the the model training, the once the model is out there and it's it's producing results and the and then on top of that what fiddler's known for it's like extra flavor of the explainability and uh, i don't know if josh or amy wants to answer that first but i'll, I'll start um because i think that's a great question and it's it's kind of forward looking as like where's where's this industry going and i i think it's going to it's going to go to um monitoring as a or not just monitoring but integrating um model management and model performance management um, throughout the life cycle. And since machine learning life cycle is iterative and is, is cyclical, um, anything that's trying to, you know, if you're like thinking about ML ops, 
uh, in general, anything touching that should be cyclical and should be life cycle as well, or should at least fit within that concept. And I think that's fairly natural. If you think, if you think, if any of you are old, old enough to think about um, what happened in the systems management space, like maybe 10 years ago, um, where things were siloed, and then you started to see, you know, tools and platforms come together and actually look and link together handoffs. Um, I think we've seen this starting to see the same thing happening um, with DevOps uh, and or maybe has really, well, it still has some maturity, uh, but and now we're starting to see that happening with um, ML ops as well. And so whether you're talking about, um, you know, the training, um, while you're training your data, you would want to understand, I would assume a data scientist would want to understand what are my feature importance that as I'm going through training and maybe I actually want to fiddle around with you know, um, with different uh, elements so that I can understand, you know, the impact of different features, um, the the quality, potential bias uh, as I'm training. I don't want to wait till it's out there in the world to check for something like bias, for goodness sakes, uh, or, you know, just to understand my, my model battle or for validation. So if you're in the validation phase, um, how do I validate um, the accuracy of this model compared to another model? Um, or certain slices of the model. And then, of course, you've got the deployment phase that we've been talking mostly about today. Uh, but then when something goes wrong, you, of course, go into this kind of analyze phase. And we did talk a little bit about that. Uh, but then you go back into this um, phase where you're trying to improve your model, which may be, which is probably actually offline um, when you, or it could be online, kind of spans a little bit of both. So it's kind of cyclical. Uh, and I think that's just kind of natural to see um, anybody in the ML app space providing solutions there to, to go down that track. Because we've seen it in, um, you know, other, whether you're talking about application performance manage, uh, management or, um, you know, general DevOps, you, we, we see, you see that over and over again in different industries as things mature. And I would say one of the things that is probably the next phase that I have not seen a lot um, done yet in the, the machine learning space is actually to span out to business metrics. So mm -hmm. you can not only, you can understand, we've been talking about data drift today. What's the impact to your features? What's the impact to your predictions? What's the impact to the business? So how do I then link that information? And maybe that's via a Tableau or some other business logic, but how do I then link that information to actual cost of, um, the false positives. Wow. So anyhow, sorry, that's a long answer, but it's something I feel pretty passionate about that we're we're going down that. Beautiful that to track. think about. Yeah, yeah, I hadn't thought about that at all. Josh, last one for you. What would you advise for new data science teams that are being set up as to how to approach model performance monitoring? Yeah. Um... Well, obviously, I'm supposed to try to sell you a fiddler. Um, but, you know, I don't think it's madness, you know, if you're a new team and you may be at a small stage of a project where you're, you know, rolling out the first one or two models um, and trying to figure out kind of what your practice, you know, what your, what your um, uh, sort of discipline is about um, performance monitoring. So... You know, if, if I was going to try to roll my own, um, you know, developing kind of like robust um, data logging for model inference, so feature vectors and predictions, um, you know, in, in some way that was queryable that let you slice, that's going to be really important for diagnosing problems. Um, you know, having a practice of regularly, uh, you know, if you were going to watch one thing, if you have accurate, if you have, if, if you have ground truth, then not all use cases will give you, you know, the classic example is that you're, you're, you're issuing 30 year mortgages. You don't get the ground truth anytime soon. Um, and, and the ones you do get soon are, are biased. Um, you know, if you have access to, uh, to, to accuracy, if your labels come in fast enough, you know, being able to do uh, a regular periodic um, analysis, you know, whatever the relevant time scale is, you know, basically you, you want to set up the practice of keeping your eye on the performance numbers. Um, if you don't have ground truth, you know, changes in prediction can be indicative of your features drifting around. Um, I mean, I'm kind of reiterating what I think of as kind of the, 
the high level metrics that come out of Fiddler, but um, you know, build a practice of logging, of regularly monitoring accuracy, regularly monitoring uh, you know, model output, um, and make sure you have the ability to slice into that if you need to diagnose something or look for a problem. Um, the one other thing I would add here is it can be very helpful to have a measure of, um, of feature impact. So like Amy was talking about before, you've got things like Shapley values or integrated gradients for, for, um, for point explanations, but there's permutation and random ablation feature impact that'll give you a kind of in broad strokes what a model cares about. Um, and that can help a whole lot to focus your, your diagnostics. So, you know, if you're gonna just monitor a couple of features out of many, make sure that you're watching the ones that are the most important ones to your model. Um, yeah, I think those are kind of the high level tips. Um, Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you, Amy, for this excellent presentation. Thank you, Josh, for the cameo. And <laughs> thank you, everybody that is here with us still. I really enjoyed this meetup. If you are watching in the future, uh, you've probably heard me say it before, but I'm going to say it again. We love those likes and subscribes and comments, all that good stuff. We're going to be back next week. So same place, same time. Join us. This is talk four of four on our monitoring month. Uh, no more excuses. I don't want to hear any of those excuses that Amy was talking about at the beginning of the talk where people say that a rogue model cost them a half a million or two weeks time. You should know now how to fix that. If it wasn't in the talk today, it was probably in one of the three talks that we just had. So check out our our YouTube channel if you haven't seen any of those other ones and you really like this topic. That's all for today. Thank you, and we will see you all later.